Um, my background is uh, physics, computational physics, or biophysics. So uh, um, I thought uh, the previous speaker, Philip, will talk about uh, statistical physics, but uh, our starting point may be different. Okay. Um, so actually, this is what we do. Yeah, I did a lot of drug design, and in the past, uh, we, degen uh, we generate a series of uh, uh, new drugs for treating pain and uh, neurodegenerative diseases, and another serious drug for cancer, cancer prevention, cancer treatment, and totally for these two series of drugs, we probably have uh, 15 patents, and uh, <coughs> both of them has been uh, licensed to uh, companies in Taiwan. But these are not what <laughs> I'm going to talk about. So as I said, it's a very new experience for me to talk about uh, something like this uh, in this uh, workshop. So uh, uh, we all know the uh, Ludwig Boltzmann has a great contribution to the field of uh, statistical physics. His dream was uh, we may be possible to derive from the uh, uh, microscopic world the motion of atoms and the interaction among them. <laughs> and finally, we can get macroscopic uh, quantities like uh, what you learn in uh, thermodynamics. And it's, uh, it's a long way. It's not trivial. Yeah? And people are getting better because now uh, we have a much better computing facility. You can describe the interactions among the uh, molecules uh, with uh, much better accuracy. So I will show you some example, especially floating folding. And uh, this is the notorious high dimension uh, Leo talked about yesterday. So uh, in statistical physics, if you, talk, if you think about the simulation that we are doing, uh, usually the number of particles, typical ones, uh, is from uh, 10,000 to maybe 10 million. So you have to time to six then you have the dimensionality of the so-called phase space uh, in the uh, Boltzmann sense. This is, of course, terrible. Okay? And therefore, people are thinking about methods to exploit uh, this uh, phase space efficiently. And uh, it's always a question how to get the so-called important sampling and get the proper quantities that you want. And this is a paper Leo mentioned also yesterday. What's the meaning of, uh, well, when is the uh, nearest neighbor meaningful? Okay, I strongly encourage you also to read this article. Uh, a lot of things are very different in high dimension. Okay, I think this paper has been cited for more than 2,200 <coughs> times. So it's a very well known paper. And uh, people who are doing molecular dyne simulations, now it's uh, quite uh, popular to construct the so called uh, Markov state models, which is based on uh, uh, aggregation of the conformations into the so-called microstates, and then look at the transition among the microstates, and you do the so-called kinetic lumping, and you get the so-called uh, macrostates. And once you get this kind of picture, then you can look at the transition of your conformations or different states uh, and try to understand the function of, for example, the drug. Some drug will be the so-called agonist. They have a very totally different function compared to the antagonist. By using molecular dyne simulation, you may be able to understand the function of uh, different kinds of drugs. Okay? And uh, uh, roughly speaking, there are two major ways of exploring the phase space. One is a so-called Monte Carlo um, molecular dyne simulation, and the other one is a Monte Carlo simulation. I will talk about both very quickly. And uh, for Monte Carlo dyne simulation, uh, usually people know if you have a high density system, it will be more efficient than the Mon Monte Carlo methods. Okay, and also Monte Carlo dyne simulation uh, is uh, intrinsically parallelizable, and therefore. Uh, it has uh, certain advantages to uh, explore the phase space. But I have to say, uh, some people still do not give up the hope of using Monte Carlo method, and uh, I'm one of them, although I did a lot of molecular dyne simulation. And uh, the title of today's talk actually was an attempt 
try to use the uh, Monte Carlo method to explore the conformational space of the proteins. And uh, the people in the field of molecular dyne simulation, a lot of them use this kind of force field uh, formalism. So you, they use the bound energy, the angle, and torsional energy, van der Waal interaction, and the Coulomb interaction to describe the interactions between the atoms inside the molecule or uh, between the molecules. And uh, so you can imagine you need to have a lot of different parameters for atoms in different molecules, you assign different atom types, and uh, on top of the atom type, you talk about the bound parameters, angle parameters, torsional parameters, van der Waal parameters. And uh, for the charges on each atom, you have to use the quantum chemical approaches to get these partial charges so that you can calculate the Coulomb interactions. And uh, we also have to deal with uh, the choice, whether you use uh, explicit solvent or implicit solvent, uh, pretty much depends on the question. Uh, if you are looking at, for example, protein folding, which is not very complicated uh, a protein, and you think it should fold uh, in a general aqueous solution, then probably implicit solvent approach can work. And I will show you one example. And in many situations, Maybe you have to use a more detailed description of the system that is experience solvent simulations. That means all the water molecules has be, to be taken into account. And uh, there are several popular uh, water models like tip 3 p SPC. I think a lot of people just use these two still, even nowadays. They were invented in 1980s, 82, 80, and still, uh, very popularly used nowadays. I'm sorry, I didn't yes. Water molecules were invented in 1982? Yes. Eight. These water models were invented in oh. 1980. Models. The models. I thought the molecules themselves. Oh, that's <laughs> created by God. <laughs> <laughs> okay. People used to uh, so joke to say tip 3 p is uh, American water. SPC is a European water because one is uh, created by Jorgensen in Purdue, and uh, SPC was uh, proposed by uh, Hermann Berenson in Netherlands. Okay, and both are quite popular, and of course you can imagine <coughs> maybe in the US a lot of people use the TCP, and in Europe a lot of people use the SPC, something like that. Still nowadays, okay, and but I would say most of these water models perform very well. Uh, there are very few parameters, but they can reproduce a lot of physical properties of water, and including the uh, pair distribution function that we just talked about, but this is a simplified version. So you can see they fit to experimental data very well. Okay. And uh, if you are working on distributed solvent simulations, you use this kind of periodic boundary conditions. Yes, your question. What, is what was the criteria? It's a pair distribution function, G of R. Radio distribution function. Yeah, this is what you can compare with the X ray diffraction data. Okay. Um, so, when you do molecular dyne simulation, of course, you need to have velocity on each atom. And people try to use the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution uh, to assign the velocities on each atom. That's what people do. And I have to say, uh, this is a very dangerous step. Uh, if you use some probability to do this, of course, uh, statistically, you'll be correct, okay? Because you want to conform to this kind of probability distribution. But how do you know this atom should be this velocity and that atom should be that velocity? So you can imagine um, there will be a lot of collisions in the beginning. So if you have uh, some important information in your system, for example, the pressures of protein conformation, you probably want to restrain them in the beginning until when your system has been equilibrated, then you release your restraint for the subsequent simulations. And uh, people in this field, a lot of them use this kind of uh, uh, weak coupling thermostat to control the temperature of your system. Okay, it's a kind of extension of uh, Newtonian dynamics. 
if you look at just these two, it's F equals MA. This is Newtonian equation of motion. But this part is a thermostat. By using this kind of uh, uh, scaling formula, then you control your system to your desired temperature. Okay? And uh, if you want to control the density of your simulation, when you do the experience arm simulation, then you can control the density. Then you have to calculate the so-called instantaneous pressure tensor. It looks like this. You have the so-called virial turn. Uh, uh, so this is kinetic energy and then the virial turn. And uh, uh, it depends on the system you simulate. For bulk water, aqueous phase, then you can use just isotropic pressure regulation to control the pressure in different directions. But for a system like a membrane protein, yeah, because you have intrinsic uh, asymmetry in your, in your system, then you have to use uh, anisotropic pressure regulation. Otherwise, you could have artifacts. OK, and for molecular dyne simulation, uh, people don't like it, but we have to use it because uh, uh, the most uh, popular approach is by using this kind of leaf uh, algorithm. It's a symplectic. Uh, it's quite robust, and therefore people uh, use it. Uh, the disadvantage of this kind of uh, approach to solve the Newtonian equation of motion is that you have to choose a proper time step. You can imagine if you use a very small time step, then you are wasting your time. If you choose too large time step, then your system will have an artificial collision, and it will become unstable, and uh, eventually the system crash. When your system crash, you cannot do anything any longer. So you have to choose a prop appropriate uh, time step uh, to do your simulation. For biological simulations, uh, actually the, the typical time step is about one femtosecond. That's 10 to the minus 15 seconds. Okay? If you use a constraint dynamics, then you can use a two femtosecond. And recently there are some tricks that allows you to use a four femtoseconds. Okay? And uh, currently, uh, uh, very few people can do millisecond <coughs> simulation. On, only, uh, for example, the group in uh, New York, D. Shaw's lab, they have a special CPU just for molecular dynamics simulation. And because of that kind of ASIC, they can achieve millisecond time scales. But not for my lab. I cannot do millisecond simulation. It's too expensive for me. Uh, they, told, they told me it's probably uh, 5 million US dollar if you want to buy one rack. For a single millisecond. <laughs> no, you can do it multiple. You can do multiple simulations. Yeah. OK. The typical time scale for protein folding is from millisecond to uh, seconds. But, of course, but actually, there are some small proteins which can fold much faster. And I will show this kind of example. And for implicit solvent simulations, people use the so-called poisson boltzmann theory. It's solving the dif partial differential equation. You give a boundary about, you know, uh, the, for the potentials. And you use a different method to try to get the actual static potential. Uh, the problem for this kind of approach is, although it's uh, physical, but it's quite expensive. Uh, some people are still working on this, but uh, a lot of people turn to a different approach called generalized Born theory. It was proposed in 1990, okay? Uh, it's a kind of generalization of the original theory of uh, Max Born, published in 1920, okay? And uh, uh, original Born theory only applied to ions. And in 1990, people generalized it for general or organic molecules. Okay, and later on also applied it to proteins, nucleic acids. And it's like this. So instead of a radius, now you have a so-called e effective radius and you have a smooth function here uh, to take the place of ion radius. And then you can use it to describe for general organic molecules. And uh, you can also deal with uh, electrolyte solution. And people uh, start to do that uh, around 1999. And actually, the people who did this is in this university. Uh, David Case is one of the 
uh, very important figures in our field. He's now in Rutgers also. And you can use uh, a kind of mapping to the linearized boson bone spine theory so that for the generalized bone, you can have a very similar equation to deal with the electrolyte solution. Okay? And if you use implicit solvent description for your system, you don't really have the water molecules. How do you mimic the effect of solvents? So people use the so-called Langevin dynamics. So similarly, here you have a Newtonian equation of motion, F equals MA, and now you have a friction term. So imagine if you have a molecule inside water, uh, they will have some frictions from water. They will reduce your kinetic energy. But on the other hand, water also collides on your molecule, so give you input of the energy. So they will balance if you are in a, a thermal reservoir. So if you are in a reservoir of uh, some constant temperature, then these two terms are in balance. This is the spirit of a so-called Langevin dynamics. It's uh, mainly used for implicit solvent. And uh, uh, the guiding theory to have the balance of the two is the so-called fluctuation dissipation theory. Okay, then we come back to the biological problem, but protein folding problem. Okay, I heard some audience is going to work on this kind of problem. Uh, so around 1980s, uh, a scientist called Cyrus Levintat um, make a good uh, metaphor about this kind of problem. So think about a protein, which is not too huge, say just 100 amino acids. And then we uh, uh, underestimate the complexity of the system. Say for each amino acid, it can only take three different conformations. Okay, it's a highly simplification of the problem. Then how, how many conformations will that be? It's three to 100. In terms of 10 base, it's five to the five times 10 to the 47. Okay, it's, it's a number. We don't know how, how big it is. And uh, let's uh, overestimate the conformational transition rate. For example, it could be 10 to the minus 13. This is overestimate. Then totally, for one structure, st start from random conformation, and toward the native structure, it could take this time, it will be five times 10 to the 34 seconds. In other words, 1.6 times 10 to the 27 years. This is much, <coughs> much longer than the entire time of our universe. So effectively it says protein will never fold. Okay, but of course we know this is not the case. Protein always fold every day if you are doing experiments, and therefore it's a paradox. Okay, there's a something wrong, something wrong in this paradox, like a lot of paradox in mathematics, like the Zeno paradox, etc. Okay, and uh, we know with the molecular dye simulation we can fold small proteins, and this has been done since uh, you know year 2000. Okay, in the year 2002, the people in the uh, University of Washington, they designed a new protein with uh, this sequence, and they used NMR to determine the structure. And almost the same time, uh, Carlos Simmerling, who is in SUNY, uh, Buff uh, SUNY Stony Books, I think, um, they, they uh, start to do their simulation, and they want to see whether the predictive structure can be the same as the one determined by NMR. And here, actually, you see the superposition of two structures, one from simulation, one from the NMR experiment. So very nice agreement, OK? And uh, they continue to uh, work on methodology. And this is one of their recent paper. Now, with the advance of a computer architecture, especially with a GPU, you can fold small protein just in days, OK? It's possible now. And this is one example, the folding simulation. OK, I just did it um, a few days ago <laughs> before I came here. Before I came here, actually, I had to organize a bilateral conference between Academia Sinica and Kyoto University. So I was doing something like this in between. <laughs> OK, so uh, here totally I show you uh, how many? Uh, 
4,000 snapshots. So it will be uh, four microseconds in this simulation. It can be done in less than two days. Okay, and actually putting four and four many times during the simulation, it's too quick, and my sampling is probably not enough, and therefore. I have to uh, do some analysis to pick up the uh, conformation with the smallest RMSD compared to the native structure. It's something like this, and it was in uh, 195 nanoseconds. But actually, I can tell you, in 40 nanoseconds, there was also a similar structure already occurred. Okay? Um, yes? This, how many atoms did it have? This, this is short uh, protein, right? There are only 20 amino acids. Yeah, 20 amino acids. Yes. In I have to say, um, the so-called RMSD does not have an absolute meaning. You have to judge the meaning of this kind of quantity with uh, molecular graphics to get the mapping. Yeah. Yes. And this one was uh, uh, not too bad uh, compared to the original native structure. Okay. You can judge by uh, graphics only if your protein is small, because if it has like, I don't know, 10,000 amino acids, I think it's quite complicated. Yes. So, like the paper mentioned, why is the meaning? Uh, where is the, where is uh, near the neighbor meaningful? Uh, telling this, about. Well, yeah. okay, So, was this the best protein, the best simulation, in your judgment, or is it the one with the lowest Angstrom uh, RMSD? So here I pick up this conformation simply based on the number. Okay, on the number. Okay. Based on the number, but if you look at the rank. I pick up uh, the I can pick up the conformation with the small numbers of RMSD, and I I can tell you, uh, you can find similar conformations at earlier time. That's why I said, if you accept this as a uh, folded conformation, then in the simulation it shows that uh, this small protein has fold and unfold many many times. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, you can also start from NMR structure. And interestingly, I found they will stay mainly just like the original NMR structure. Oh. You don't see so much dynamics. <laughs> it's still kind of intriguing. Yeah, so uh, somehow the NMR structure is really quite stable. I will show uh, the branch and prune algorithm with the uh, uh, original MR structure in the end of my talk. Okay, so then we switch to monocular methods. So you already see what we can do with the molecular dyne simulations. How about monocular methods? Okay, actually when I first did my master's degree, I'm a fan of uh, monocular simulations. I believe monocular should beat molecular dyne simulation. I'm still working on it. <laughs> Although I did a lot of molecular dyne simulation as well. Okay, and uh, the term was uh, coined by Metropolis uh, because uh, uh, Ulan's uncle uh, liked to go to Monte Carlo to do gambling, and they are European. Yeah? And uh, this is how Monte Carlo looked like, uh, not far from France, uh, very near to Nice. And uh, you can use Monte Carlo method for approximating, for example, the number pi, and you can use Monte Carlo method for uh, integration in high dimension. Okay, this is a very important point. Um, for example, you can use uh, this to estimate again the number of pi. And here it tells you a very important property of multi uh, color integration because it doesn't uh, change for the scaling for different dimension. Always one over square root of n. If you use, for example, trapezoidal rule, then it will be terrible. Yeah, you don't have this kind of uh, nice property. And therefore, people have some faith in Monte Carlo method, like me, okay? But still, because of the problem I mentioned in the beginning, so far we don't have a good implementation of the Monte Carlo approach. So when I uh, met Antonio a couple years ago, I think it was four years ago in a conference in Granada in Spain, I learned about his approach then I think maybe we can use the solution generated by the branch and prune algorithm uh, as a kind of multicolor move. That was my original idea. That's why we have uh, this talk. 
Uh, so here in the Monte Carlo approach, you talk about the evolution of the system. You use the so-called master equation to de describe the time evolution of system. So you, in different Monte uh, uh, Markov states, you have transition probability. And uh, after a long time, you have an equilibrium uh, probability distribution of your different macro states. And the transition matrix will also become uh, more or less constant. So the simplest solution for this kind of master equation is the so-called detailed balance uh, condition. OK, it's a very strong condition. You don't need to have it. But uh, it's very convenient. Once you apply this, your system is uh, forced to have this kind of equilibrium property. And then you can have the so-called metropolis algorithm based on the detailed balance condition. And we know, actually, the distribution of the different states should follow the Boltzmann distribution. And then Metropolis reach to uh, have this algorithm for the selection of the uh, new configurations like this. So in short, when you go to a new conformation, if the energy is lower, then you ex accept it. If the energy is higher, then use uh, uh, a dice and this probability to judge whether you accept the new conformation or not. OK, so why I love Monte Carlo simulation? because my master thesis work. I work on spin gas theory and also traveling salesman's problem at the time, which was uh, 1990, 92, OK? Um, it's uh, like a putting folding problem. It's terrible. Uh, you have a combinatorial explosion, even when you, for example, have just 100 points in your graph. Then the total number of, of uh, a pass is this number. It will take 1.5 times 10, 10 to the 138 years to go through all the uh, passes, even if you have all the computer in the world. OK. So it's a terrible uh, situation. So uh, I had to go, go through it quickly. So we use uh, simulating learning to do that. The problem for this kind of approach is simulating learning is very slow. OK, you have to heat up to the high temperature and cool it down slowly. And we also know there's another algorithm based on space thin curve of fractal geometry, and published also around the time I did my uh, master degree. So uh, I try to find a way to link the two. Use the algorithm here, the Michael Kuhl's algorithm. So we start from the solution of the, from the fractal geometry. If we can get the temperature, of this graph. Then we can continue with some simulating on kneeling and then cool it down to get a good solution. OK, so this is what you can get with a very time consuming uh, simulating on kneeling. OK, so in general, uh, for uh, molecular system, you don't have this kind of uh, fractal geometry approach. Usually, you have to do some random translation. OK. Random rotation, try to rotate some bounds, or crankshaft algorithm to do that. And uh, this is the algorithm to generate random vectors on the sphere. So we come to a uh, decent geometry problem. I already told you my motivation. So this is a very famous photo. You can easily Google it on the web. And uh, uh, all the important people are here. I'm not included, OK? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Which one? This is too young, or? Uh, I have a t-shirt. <laughs> OK, so slightly different now. OK, OK. so we know this. Uh, it's an NP-hard problem, but uh, these people figure out a discretizable approach to solve the problem. So with uh, NMR, and then you can get some distances. It's an un incomplete matrix, but still, uh, most of the time, I think you can get a solution for the structure. And uh, you use this kind of uh, discretizable uh, DGP to get a solution with a branch and prompt algorithm. Uh, according to my experiences, usually to get two set of the solutions and with a two uh, totally opposite chirality. Okay. Fortunately, I found a molecule a mechanics force field can easily distinguish these two clusters. The one with the wrong chirality has a much higher energy. 
So it's a good thing for me. So I can easily use the energy to pick up the correct uh, uh, cluster. OK, so uh, you use this to uh, uh, generate your solution. Yeah, and for the uh, interval distance data, actually Antonio recently has uh, already uh, revised his uh, original algorithm. You can work on it, uh, but it will be a bit slower. Uh, so we are still seeking the opportunity whether we can improve this algorithm uh, for the interval distance cases. So uh, usually the initial uh, solution you got is like this. Okay, pretty close, but for some unknown subtle reason, only very close. We have to use, for example, uh, uh, minimization with the generalized born energy to get a really uh, fit. Uh, you can re reproduce the secondary structure. Okay, I skip some of the, the detail here. And here are some more examples showing uh, our approach can reproduce uh, NMR structures. And uh, here is uh, the evolution with the generalized born energy. So in each branch of problem uh, solution, we can get multiple solutions, right? And in the so-called single edit evolution, we only pick up the best. And from the best, it will generate a new set of the solutions. And for the new set of solutions, we still continue to look for the best. And this is an uh, animation for the single edit evolution. And the other one, I try to do something different. When you generate a set of conformations, I try to look up the maximally uh, uh, self-avoiding conformation. Okay, try to explore the space um, uh, as much as possible. And uh, so in the end of the simulation, you will see it will be different from the uh, original Chris, uh, NMR structure. So that's probably pretty much my talk, and thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, but GPU is very cheap. Yeah. It's probably uh, 10,000 US dollar, you can get one. And then nowadays you can, you can rent uh, computing from uh, Amazon or Google. Oh yeah, that's also possible. I just haven't yet tried. It's yeah. like we're entering this new age where Yeah, I was a bit worried that maybe the transfer of the data would be quite time consuming. Yeah, that's I would feel guilty if I do this. Yeah, <laughs> I have to transfer a lot of data from US and to Taiwan. You know, I prefer to do computation just locally and don't, don't waste the network bandwidth. Okay. Yes? Yeah, but I told you it's uh, some unknown subtle reason. I'm still checking the code. Why I need to do this, I don't know yet. Okay. Yeah. But the very small di difference. In terms of MSD, it's only 0.1 angstrom. Very small. Very, very small. Yeah. Ideally, I don't want to use the generalized bone to minimize the structure. But for, for that, I have to find out a bug or some, some kind of unknown problem. Yeah. Yep. Thank you.